Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mangus and today we are doing a truly special Fire Emblem character, Spotlights. I featured villains on the series before, but never one of this caliber. This may just be one of the most popular villains in the Fire Emblem series to date. An armored juggernaut that has earned the admiration and respect of the fanbase, and possibly one of the reasons the Tellius games are so fondly remembered to this day. Today we take a look at the dark horse of the Fire Emblem franchise, none other than the imposing, legendary Black Knight. I am here to protect you. Before we begin the spotlight, I'm going to drop an obligatory spoiler warning. There is no way for me to do the spotlight without revealing the Black Knight's identity, so if you want to experience the shocking reveal for yourself, please close this video and come back once you've completed both Tellius games. I will also be spoiling major parts of Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn in the spotlight, so consider yourselves warned. Before he became the Black Knight, Selgius lived in Dane. He had a miserable childhood growing up, as he bore the shameful mark of the Branded, a product of an ancestor of his father's side having a relationship with the Lagoose. What type of a Lagoose this was is not directly revealed to us in the game, but based on the appearance of the Brand, his facial features, as well as his astounding speed in battle, it can be speculated that it was one of the bird tribes, and most likely a raven due to his dark hair. Due to the Brand, Zelgius was hated and looked down on by both his family and everyone around him. Branded people in Tellius society were always treated with scorn and contempt by both races due to the extreme prejudice they held towards each other, with the Lagoose being the most aggressive as they could sense the Brand from afar. As a result, Zelgius was an outcast regardless of where he went, and thus he made the decision to join the military to escape the shame. While he was part of the army, Selgius would always wear armor in public to conceal his brand, never removing it unless he was sure he was alone. Without the constant scorn of those around him holding him back, he found that he was strong, and quickly rose through the ranks to become a respected soldier of Dane. He studied the blade under one of the legendary four riders, a man known as Gawain, who quickly became his idol, someone he revered as the greatest swordsman ever. At some point, Zelgius noticed that he was aging more slowly than his fellow soldiers, this being the result of his branded heritage. Zelgius worried that one day people would start to suspect his true nature and eventually turn on him, and this caused him great distress and worry. Sometime later, Selgius lost his beloved teacher Gawain when he and his wife Helena had to flee Dane due to a conflict with the Mad King Ashnard. Selgius swore that he would one day seek out Gawain and duel him to determine if he had truly surpassed his teacher. A few years later, Selgius was visited by a strange sage who called himself Laron. For some reason that he could not begin to explain, Selgius felt a strange kinship with the sage and felt confident that he could trust him, and so he revealed his branded heritage, wondering if there was a way for the wise sage to remove it. Sadly, Laron explained that removing the brand was impossible, but offered him something else instead. When it came time for Selgius to leave the military, Laron urged him to seek him out, to help him in his quests, promising Selgius that at the very least, he would no longer be alone. Staying true to his word, Selgius left the Dane army shortly after, and traveled to Begnion. Back in Begnion, Laron had joined the Senate under the name Sephiron, while Selgius joined the military, where he quickly began to rise through the ranks due to his incredible talent and skill. He quickly became one of Begnion's most respected generals, all the while secretly working as an agent of Laron, aiding him in his dark ambitions, which involved attempting to awaken the dark goddess Yuna slumbering inside the Laron's medallion by inciting a global war. A few years prior to the events of Path of Radiance, Selgius and Laron traveled to Gallia to locate the medallion and the man who guarded it, Selgius' former teacher Gawain, now known as Grail. When they eventually located him, they found that Grail had already accidentally touched the medallion, which had caused him to go onto a berserker rampage, murdering everyone around him, including his wife Helena. Laron and Selgius also encountered his children, Ike and Mists. Ike had witnessed the entire event and was in shock, so in order to spare him the trauma, Laron used his mystical powers to wipe Ike's memory of the events. They also saw that Mist was holding the medallion, but seemed immune from its destructive effects. The two figured it would be safer to leave the medallion in her hands for the time being, until the time came to unleash it upon the world. Some years later, Laron set in motion his plans to awaken the Dark God by inflicting a terrible war on Tellius. 
He provided Selgius with a set of black armor blessed by the goddess Ashra to make it impervious to harm, as well as the blade Alandite and some warp powder, which would allow Selgius to quickly teleport between continents. The plan was to have Selgius enter the service of King Ashnard of Dane as a double agent. Lara knew that Ashnard would gladly allow Selgius into his service the moment he witnessed his strength and skill with the blade, as the Mad King cared nothing for bloodlines and heritage, but only about martial prowess. To further solidify this plan, he also gave Selgius an extra set of blessed armor to provide to the king as a gift. Just as Laren had predicted, Ashnard immediately accepted Selgius, now under his new alias of the Black Knight, into his service, and even made him one of the four riders, the highest position of leadership in Dane's armies. In order to start awakening the Dark God, Laren ordered Selgius to take Laren's medallion from Grail and give it to Ashnard. Using his war powder, Selgius teleported to Gallia and tracked down Grail, who was now leading a band of mercenaries. He first encountered them in the ruins of Fort Maritime, where Grail was busy squaring off against Patrine, another one of Dane's four riders, and completely humiliating her in the process. Realizing that he would not get the one-on-one -on -one fight he was hoping for in these halls, Selgius retreated, but not before having a stare down with Grail, silently issuing a challenge he knew the veteran swordsman could not resist. Later that same night, instinctively knowing that Grail would seek him out, Selgius waited in a forest clearing near Castle Gebal, where the mercenaries had holed up for the knights. Accepting his challenge, Grail strode out to meet him, and the two started their duel. Knowing that Grail could not hope to leave a scratch on him with his axe, Selgius threw him the sword Ragnell, another blade blessed by the goddess. Grail, now recognizing the voice of his former apprentice, refused to take up the sword, but not due to pride, but by simply being unable to wield it. Unbeknownst to Selgius, Grail had severed the tendons in his arm after the incident with the medallion so that he would never again be able to wield the sword, and as a result, he was greatly weakened and merely a shadow of his former self. The two continued fighting, not even stopping when Ike entered the clearing, but due to Grail's handicap, he was quickly overwhelmed and defeated by Selgius, who was astounded that there was no challenge, no resistance. Disappointed by the pitiful challenge provided to him by his former master, Selgius also soon learned that Grail did not have the medallion, and so he threatened to torment his daughter if he did not hand it over. He was about to kill Ike as well, who was crying beside the body of his fallen father, when he heard the roar of the Lion King Canagus, who was fast approaching. Knowing that a fight against the King of Gallia would not be an easy one, he retreated, using his war powder to teleport him to safety. Selgius would later travel to the port city of Toha to rendezvous with one of Dane's generals, Makoya, who had fortified his soldiers within the city awaiting the arrival of the Grail mercenaries, who were looking to seize a ship to transport them to Begnion. When Selgius offered to help the soldiers in the fight against the mercenaries, Makoya pleaded him to stay his blade, as he wanted his restless soldier to gain some much-needed fighting experience, knowing that if the Black Knight were to join the fray, the fight would be over in an instant. Selgius respected that decision and observed the battle from one of the houses in the city, but did eventually decide to go outside when he observed the Dane army was losing. He was about to intercept Ike when he was attacked by Ranulf, who distracted him long enough for Ike and the rest of the Grail mercenaries to capture a ship and escape. After the battle in Toha, the Black Knight returned to Dane to report to King Ashnard, who then tasked him with a new mission, to prepare for an invasion of Gallia, but to avoid provoking them into a full-scale war, probably to ensure that Gallia still had the strength remaining to fight the upcoming Tellius World War. Later in the war, Selgius learned of the survival of the two Herons, Leanne and Raisin, whose unique Galdor song could supposedly awaken the god within the medallion, and also informed Ashnard about their whereabouts while at the same time he lied to Ashnard by informing him that Ike was not a threat. At this point, Selgius had started to take an interest in Ike's potential as a warrior and saw him as a chance to fight his former master, and thus he wanted Ashnard to view him as a joke so that the Dane King would not send his full force after him. The Mad King then tasked Selgius to abduct one of the Herons and bring him the medallion. Helped by the traitor Nasir, who was coerced by Ashnard to infiltrate Ike's army, Selgius was able to get a hold of the medallion and oversaw its delivery to Anna and Patrine at Dane Keep. 
Shortly after Selgius left the capital, Ike and the Crimean Liberation Army marched into Dane, and after winning many crucial battles, they took the capital of Navasa. At this point, Sephiron had returned to Begnion as senator, and with the assistance of Empress Sanaki, he tossed Selgius to march the Begnion army up to the capital to assist Ike. The two even met in person, though Ike did not recognize Selgius without his black armor. Ike took a troop of Begnion soldiers and marched on towards Crimea, but tossed Selgius to remain behind with the rest of his soldiers and govern Dane in his absence, effectively conceding control of the capital to Begnion. At this point, Selgius had now taken a massive interest in Ike, and kept observing him from afar. He used his war powder to teleport to Castle Delbray in Crimea, where Ike and his Liberation Army fought another battle. After Ike had successfully taken the castle, he met the Black Knight outside and challenged him to a duel. However, due to Selgius' blessed armor, Ike was unable to harm him. Selgius informed him that with the blade Ragnell, whom Ike had taken from his father's burial site as a memento, Ike would be able to injure him. With this piece of information imparted, he informed him that their next battle would be their final one. After retreating from Castle Delbray and leaving Ike to retake Crimea, Selgius used his war powder to travel to the royal palace of Phoenicis, where Princess Leanne resided under the guardianship of the Hawk King Tibarn. After infiltrating the castle and mortally wounding Leanne's protector Lotz, Selgius warped himself and Leanne to the Tower of Grynea, where the dark scientist Izuka was experimenting upon the Lagus. Luckily for Leanne, Naisala showed up disguised as a soldier to rescue her away from the tower before any harm could befall her. At this point, Phoenicis and Gallia had joined forces with the Crimean Liberation Army and was about to march into Crimea itself to rid the capital of Ashnard. Selgius was tossed with defending Nada's castle, but left his garrison to one of his generals while he himself awaited Ike inside the throne room. He was also tossed by Ashnard to kill Enna, as they no longer had any use for her. Right as Ike entered the throne room, Selgius finished her off, but he did not kill her. Whether or not this was intentional or not is not known. As Ike entered the throne room alongside his sister Mists, he was carrying the sword Ragnar, ready to fight his hated enemy. However, right before the battle began, Ike informed Selgius that the reason his father had lost was because he had robbed himself of his dominant sword arm. Once Selgius heard this, everything made sense to him, and he realized that he never fought Gawain at all, merely his shadow. Shortly after the fight began, he realized that Ike was not yet his father's equal, but that one day, he might be. So he did the only thing he could to preserve that fight. He let Ike win the duel. In the Japanese version of Path of Radiance, there is actually a huge difference in the game's plots. The Black Knight actually does not let Ike win at all, but rather loses the duel due to being weakened by the War Powder, which has the drawback of sapping its wielder's strength when used. Why they decided to change this in the localized version is unknown. They probably thought it was a bit of an unsatisfactory ending to the fights. Anyway, believing himself triumphant, Ike rushed out of the castle after his victory as it crumbled behind him due to a trap set up by the Dane soldiers. Before the rocks could crush him, Selgius was able to use his war powder to teleport to safety. Presumed dead, he removed his armor and resumed his role as Selgius, biding his time. Many years later, Selgius was once again asked by Sephiron to don his black armor and travel to Dane to protect someone a girl named Micaiah, the leader of an uprising against the oppressive Begnion occupation forces left to hold the country after General Ike conquered it many years ago. As Jared, leader of the Dane occupation forces, attempted to assassinate Micaiah, Selgius warped in to shield her, and consequently routed Jared's minions. Selgius continued to serve besides Micaiah and helped her take the capital of Nevasa. Shortly after the battle, however, he was recalled home to Begnion due to the escalation of conflicts between the Empire and the Lagus. After Begnion murdered envoys from Gallia, who came seeking answers about the truth behind the Serenus Forest Massacre, a violent event where the Heron clan was eradicated by a crazed mob setting fire to the forests, Gallia, Phoenicis, and Kilvas allied together to declare war on the Empire. Selgius was tasked with leading the Begnion forces into battle against the Lagus. While the initial momentum of the Lagus alliance took Begnion by surprise, the superior leadership abilities of Selgius kept the Begnion troop moral high, especially when the reckless Gallian general Skrimir challenged Selgius to single combat and was thoroughly defeated and humiliated in front of both armies. At the same time as he was busy leading the army, Selgius also donned his black armor and warped closer to the Dane border to assist Micaiah, who was also fighting the Lagus alongside the rest of the Dawn Brigade, forced into conflict by Vice Minister Lacane's blood contracts. 
When the Grail mercenaries showed up to reinforce the Lagoose, Selgius even met Ike on the battlefield once more, revealing to him that they had let Ike win their duel in Nada's castle, and telling him that they would soon have their final encounter. Back in Begneon, things were heating up as the Begneon Senate attempted a coup, ousting Sanaki and Sephiron from power in Begneon and tossing the latter in jail. After this, Senator Valthome took over Selgius' command of the Begneon army. Due to his loyalty, Selgius kept serving under Valthome, but he became increasingly annoyed with the senator's disloyal and disrespectful attitude, continuously breaking his word and acting in increasingly dishonorable ways, such as attacking the Crimean army from behind after both sides had declared they would pull back. For disobeying his orders to attack Crimea, Valthome ordered Selgius to be executed. Luckily for him, he was saved by Empress Sonaki when she suddenly showed up in camp. While Valthome attempted to turn the soldiers against Sanaki by calling her a false apostle, it did not work, as Sanaki was too much loved by her people. When Valthome then proceeded to insult Sephiron, Selgius snapped and put his hands around his neck, choking him in front of the entire army. After this incident, Selgius left and returned to Begneon to free Sephiron from his cell. Upon being freed, Sephiron informed Selgius that the time to awaken Asherah had come. Just as Sephiron had predicted, the massive war that ensued between Bjork and Lagus awakened Asherah, who cast her judgement upon the world, turning almost everyone into statues save for a small group of heroes, who soon began marching towards the tower in Begneon in an attempt to reverse the judgements. While the Silver Army led by Micaiah was travelling through the Grand Desert, Selgius used his war powder to come to their aid, and helping them defeat the Disciples of Order in their way. He then attempted to convince Micaiah to come back with him to the Tower of Guidance, as Asherah was about to cast another judgement on the world, which would turn the rest of Micaiah's allies to stone. She did not end up going with him, and as a result, Silgius warped back to the tower. As the three armies congregated in Begneon, they entered the Tower of Guidance and started fighting their way up through the Disciples of Order. Silgius awaited them on the second level of the tower. Once they arrived, he challenged Ike to single combat, and Ike gladly accepted. With the help of a magical barrier cutting them off from the rest of the army, Selgius and Ike could finally have their fated duel alone, without interruptions. Their fight was long and brutal, with both combatants pushing each other to the limits, but in the end, Ike gained the upper hand and scored a killing blow. Many years after they first crossed blades, Ike had finally surpassed his mortal enemy, and finally defeated him. As Selgius lay mortally wounded on the floor, he told Ike that he had finally lived up to his father's legacy, and died with a smile on his face. There is a great divide between the personality of Selgius and the behavior of the Black Knights. Selgius is brave, honorable, chivalrous, and steadfast, while the Black Knight is cruel, vindictive, terrifying, and monstrous, particularly in Path of Radiance, where he shows no quarrel fighting and killing Grail in front of his own son, only a young teenager at the time, and even threatens to torture Mist in front of a dying Grail, even if this may just have been a way to taunt Grail into giving up the location of the medallion. This inconsistency in personalities most likely stemmed from the fact that the writers were unsure of the Black Knight's story arc in Radiant Dawn, and most likely initially wrote him to be a simple villain in Path of Radiance, and then later decided to humanize this character in Radiant Dawn to portray Selgius as a more relatable character, giving him a tragic backstory and attempting to justify his motivations for wanting to fight Grail. What truly embodies Selgius as a character is his warrior nature. He lives for the thrill of a fight, and nothing excites him more than the prospects of taking on a worthy adversary, as seen when he abandons the front lines in the war against Gallia when he senses the incoming Lagoos and goes to seek them out, rather than commanding his own forces. This makes him very similar to Ike, who, while maybe a tad less ambitious and less willing to take drastic measures to seek out a challenge, truly enjoys the prospects of fighting someone strong. In fact, there is a weird kind of kinship between Selgius and Ike, as they both have a very similar relationship with Grail growing up, idolizing him as an invincible, unbeatable legend, to the point where Ike even refers to Selgius as his last teacher, upon defeating him in the Tower of Guidance. I think the reason why Ike grows to respect Selgius in the end is because he realizes that they are, at the very core, quite similar. Selgius is probably what Ike would have become were it not for the Grail mercenaries. 
They both loved fighting, and they both loved and lost their teacher. But Ike always had the mercenaries to fall back on, while Sulgius was always alone. Behind all of his power and strength, Selgius is a tragic and lonely character. His most prominent source of pain stems from his isolation. The armor he encases himself in as the Black Knight is very symbolic in a way, as it creates an impenetrable shell that hides his true self from the world, and this represents his traumatic upbringing, where he was subject to so much abuse from his family that he joined the military to escape their scorn. And even when he rose through the ranks to become a respected Dane soldier, revered by his countrymen, he still felt isolated and alone due to constantly having to hide his true nature from those around him, and continually living in fear of being discovered. Only when he meets Laron does he truly find the courage to open up and reveal his true self, and this in turn makes him a dangerous pawn for Laron's dark ambitions. For the remaining segments, I want to talk a little bit about something the game doesn't properly explain to us in Radiant Dawn, and that is, what is the intent behind the actions of Selgius? Why does he want to protect Micaiah so badly? Is he under orders from Sephiron to do so, or is it part of his own personal agenda? We learn in the Tower of Guidance that Selgius is being ordered around by Sephiron, acting as his spy and personal agent, so it seems feasible that Selgius warping in to rescue Micaiah on three different occasions is Sephiron's doing. After all, Micaiah is his descendant, so it would make sense for him to look out for his children. In the battle, he won't even retaliate against Micaiah if she attacks him. However, if you talk to Sephiron with Micaiah during the battle in the Tower, he says the following, If I had known that you still lived, I... I... No, it's too late. This changes nothing. I cannot falter. This implies that Sephiron only recently learned that Micaiah was still alive, or at the very least, that she was one of his descendants. This doesn't mean that Sephiron wasn't the one who commanded Selgius to travel to Dane to assist the Dawn Brigade, however. The liberation of Dane is something that furthered his agenda, seeing as he definitely wanted Peleus to succeed the throne, so that the Senate could use the blood contract to force him into the global Teles war. Under the oppressive Jared, Dane would have most likely collapsed in on itself and thus become a useless pawn in the upcoming war. So even if Sephiron wasn't aware that Micaiah still lived, he could still be aware of the Dawn Brigade and their plights. Another theory is that Selgius returned to Dane on his own accord to help with its liberation because he grew up there and was pained by watching his own people being oppressed. He was the one who were left in charge of Dane's occupation by Ike after all, and maybe after seeing what an awful tyrant Jared turned out to be, he returned to Dane to rectify his own mistake. Another popular theory in the fandom is that Selgius is merely looking out for Micaiah because they are both branded, and thus he feels a kinship with her, just like he felt a kinship with Sephiron when they first met. There's, of course, a bunch of shippers who like to believe that Selgius has feelings for Micaiah and justifies this as the reason why he constantly jumps into White Knight Herb, but there really isn't a lot of evidence to support this theory, aside from a bunch of wishful thinking and a lot of fan art. Another logical conclusion behind why Selgius is helping out Micaiah, at least during Act 4, is that he wants the Silver Army to make it to the Tower, as that makes it more likely he'll get his fated duel with Ike. Even though Selgius is portrayed as a person who is merely following orders, it is clear that he has his own agendas and ambitions, as Sephiron directly reveals he didn't even order Gawain killed, but that Selgius kinda just went ahead and murdered him anyway due to his own goals. So it's clear that Selgius isn't just this mindless soldier following orders. He clearly does things on his own accord. So what is it then? Why does Selgius protect Micaiah? I personally believe that it's a little bit of both. Sephiron was probably the one who initially ordered him to help out the Dawn Brigade to further his own goals, and this is probably how Selgius first met Micaiah. I doubt he just discovered her on his own. He's a pretty busy guy, and I think he has better things to do than warp around in Dane looking for branded people. However, I believe that during his time protecting Micaiah from Jared, Selgius grew a bond with her due to their branded nature, and decided that she had to keep on living. Also keep in mind that towards the end of the game, Micaiah is traveling together with Sanaki, and Selgius has clearly displayed that he's more loyal to the Apostle than he is to the Senates, so that explains why he warps away from the tower to aid the Silver Army in the desert, even if this sort of goes against the Senate's wishes. He does also try to bring Micaiah with him back to the tower after meeting her in the desert, so this could be him trying to spare her from Ashera's judgment, or it could be Sephiron ordering him to bring her back so that they can manipulate her. It really is hard to know since Radiant Dawn leaves behind so many loose threads, but I'm going to throw this one to you guys. Please let me know, why do you think Selgius was constantly protecting Micaiah? Was it his own agenda? Orders from Sephiron? A little bit of both? Or 
was he just thinking with the Salandite, if you know what I mean? Let me know in the comments below. <laughs>
Keep in mind that if you fail this battle, you will have to do all of chapter 27 over again from the start. With a little bit of preparation and some luck, however, you should be able to take down the Black Knight and be rewarded with Nasir as a playable character. If you fail, however, and run out of time, Nasir himself will show up and bonk the Black Knight for you before you both run away. Come Radiant Dawn, the Black Knight will make multiple appearances, some as a playable character, others as a boss. He is first playable in Chapter 1-9, while he will protect Micaiah from Jarrod and his minions. None of the enemies on this map even remotely poses a threat to him, and he can one-round every single one of them, Jarrod included, with ease. The challenge is keeping Micaiah alive, as she refuses to be rescued. Additionally, multiple enemies have two ranged weapons which can one-shot her if she is poorly trained, so you definitely need to be mindful of your positioning. The best way to tackle this chapter is to keep Micaiah safely behind the Black Knight at all times and attempt to pick off the two ranged attackers with the Black Knight on player face whenever they show up. If you manage to steal the Shine Barrier from the boss Weiston in Chapter 1-5, you can utilize it to protect Micaiah further, but this isn't needed with proper positioning. On a side note, enemies are much less likely to go for Micaiah if she has a strong Forge Tome with some crit on it, as they don't like the prospects of getting killed by her. If you additionally equip the Black Knight with a Bronze Lance or some other weak one range weapon, they will actually go for him rather than her, even if they deal only zero damage. The Black Knight is also playable in 1F, and deploying him on this map is one of the many requirements for unlocking the final secret character in the Tower of Guidance, so you want to do this even if you don't plan on using him. If you do want to make the chapter a little easier on yourself, he can decimate any character you send him up against, including Jared, who despite being able to survive a single hit, will still get one round KO'd as he gets double. This chapter is very challenging, with many strong enemies fighting you from the high ground, and the Black Knight is the only character that can reliably kill them with the huge ledge penalties, so using him to clear the way for the rest of your soldiers is definitely advised. You shouldn't feel too bad about wasting some experience. The Black Knight shows up once again in Chapter 3-6, as he warps in on turn 6 to help Micaiah out against the Lagoose. Once again, no enemy on the map can even remotely pose a threat to him, and he can one round any enemy he goes up against, even the bulky Tigers, without even needing to rely on his Eclipse skill. You can use him to help you out if you are getting overwhelmed by the enemy Lagoose, but the Dawn Brigade is badly in need of any experience they can get their hands on at this point, so it is recommended that you don't take too many of their kills if you can avoid it, as it really will be a long time until they get another chapter. In Chapter 3-7, when the Grill Mercenaries show up to assist the Lagoose, the Black Knight will be an enemy boss standing next to Micaiah. He will be immobile for most of the fight, but will start moving towards the player at full speed on the last two turns, or if you enter his range. Fighting him with Ike is one of the many requirements needed to unlock the final secret character in the Tower of Guidance, so you should do that if you really want to do this, but otherwise just stay away from him, there's really nothing to be gained from fighting him. If you want to fight him, however, Ike needs at least 27 speed to avoid being doubled, though you can also circumvent this by utilizing a Reaper card and just rescuing Ike out of there with a mobile flyer like Har. If your Ike is ridiculously buff, it is even possible to defeat the Black Knight, but this doesn't change anything aside from giving you some unique dialogue. The Black Knight makes another appearance in 4-3, showing up at the beginning of turn 5, but this time he is a green unit which cannot be commanded or controlled. He will help Micaiah in clearing out the enemies of the desert, but he will not move to engage the boss of the chapter, nor will the boss move to engage him. The desert slows him down quite considerably, so he is not really of great help in this chapter, but you can talk to him if you want. Finally, the Black Knight will have his final encounter with Ike in the second level of the Tower of Guidance, with a giant wall of plot separating them from the rest of the army. Almost nothing can penetrate this wall, not even ranged healing staves, but support bonuses and area skills like Daunt will. This fight is not particularly hard to beat if you are aware of the special ward tiles on the floor, which will provide Ike with plus 10 defense when he stands on them. The Black Knight starts out the fight standing on one of these tiles as well, but he is easily tempted to move off it. This means that Ike should not attack the Black Knight directly on the first turn, but rather let the Black Knight come to him instead. Ike needs a speed stat of 34 or more to double the Black Knight, which gives him a massive edge in this fight, but it is completely possible to win this fight without doubling as well. Both Ike and the Black Knight will possess the Nihil skill in this fight, at least if you didn't take it off Ike prior to his promotion, so neither side will benefit from their overpowered mastery skills, so this fight basically becomes a slugfest of stats versus stats, with Ike slowly attempting to outdamage the Black Knight's passive healing. Having Ike hold on to an elixir or concoction is also advised, especially if the fight drags on. 
If you want to absolutely trivialize this fight, however, there is an interesting maneuver you can pull off. As a vanguard, Ike gains the ability to use Axis, which allows him to wield the hammer. Since the Black Knight is considered an armored unit, the hammer inflicts triple damage, allowing Ike to kill him in two hits. Most players will have already broken their hammers at this point, especially since Radiant Dawn only gives you two of them throughout the entire game, unless you're a really cool guy and use the Heather build like me and get an extra hammer, but if you still have one, this is a fun way to quickly end the battle. There are some benefits to stalling this fight out, however. There is no time limit, but killing the Black Knight will end the chapter, and since the boss Laveil drops the S-rank Wishblade Lance, which you definitely want, waiting to kill the Black Knight is advised, though if you're in a hurry, you can use one of the Herons to reach Laveil quickly, or snipe him with long-range magic, as he is pretty slow and weak at this point. However, there is an extraordinary amount of reinforcements that will spawn continuously in this chapter, so if you have units that you would like to give some extra experience before the final stretch of the game, this is a very good time to do so. It sort of feels a little wrong to not split this rating into two, considering how different Path of Radiance Black Knight is from Radiant Dawn Black Knight. It's almost as if they're two different characters. Path of Radiance Black Knight is outright evil, with very few redeemable traits aside from his warrior's code. Radiant Dawn Black Knight is a lot more chivalrous and is even portrayed in a sympathetic light. Hell, I even call him the White Knight in Radiant Dawn due to how much he wants to protect Micaiah. Some people chalk up this to character development, claiming that Selgius became more human after the events of Path of Radiance, but I personally think that the writers just liked their own creation so much that they decided to humanize him. We see this happen to a lot of villains in other popular media. Now, despite this variance in writing, I do find Selgius to be a compelling character. He's not my favorite villain, but his actions do make sense if you learn his backstory, which can only be done by completing Radiant Dawn multiple times and fulfilling several secret bonus objectives. He comes close to a perfect rating in my book, but due to the slight inconsistency between his Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn self, I'm going to give him a 4 out of 5 star rating. I still think he's a really good villain, though. Pray that you never make a miscalculation. Some people really love the Black Knight's design, other people absolutely hate it. I've heard people criticize him for looking like a generic evil knight, while others absolutely love his terrifying appearance. Personally, for me, I'm a bit torn. His armor design is really cool, and I love his cloak and helmet, but he also appears a little bit large and clunky, and even looks a little bit out of place at times. His design has become something iconic over the years, and I certainly wouldn't call it bad by any means, but I don't think it's spectacular either. Still, I'm giving it 4 out of 5 stars. I have spent most of my life shrouded in darkness. Whether it be as a boss or a playable character, the Black Knight kicks all sorts of ass. He is easily portrayed as one of the strongest characters in the Tellius universe, rivaling or even surpassing some of the Royal Lagoos. While his final encounter can be completely trivialized by a mere hammer, I still don't feel like it's fair to give him anything but a perfect 5-star rating. He is an absolute juggernaut of destruction. Let's see how you handle this. No draw, no escape. One will live, one will die. Thank you so much for watching this Fire Emblem character spotlight. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please help it out by leaving a like and a comment and tell me what character you want to see me spotlight next. Also, if you click on the notification bell, you will automatically receive notifications every time a new video comes out. YouTube have also now added a join button in the lower right corner of the video. It sort of works like a Twitch subscription. For five bucks a month, you will get access to some unique emotes in the comment section, as well as displaying an egg next to your username that becomes progressively nicer the longer you stay subscribed. This is completely optional, but very appreciated. If you really want to help out my channel, retweeting the spotlight on Twitter and upvoting it on Reddit would be a huge help, as that attracts new viewers to my channel and helps grow my audience. If you want an incentive to do this, there's a Gleam competition in the video description where you can win a $25 Google gift card, worth approximately 45 orbs and heroes, for doing precisely these things. So you can help out my channel and get free stuff while doing it. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my amazing Patreon supporters, you guys are the absolute bests, and none of this would be possible without your continued support. If you want to become a Patreon today, you will get a bunch of rewards, such as access to the coveted Patreon Lounge, the ability to participate in Patreon Hangouts, and even the ability to request your very own Fire Emblem character spotlights. If you're interested in learning more about these rewards, head over to my Patreon page by clicking the link in the video description. 
Finally, I need to give a shout out to my designer Jake, who designs the visual aspects for these spotlights, as well as my script editors Mecha, Heliosan, Lunaris, Dr. Anime, and Illegal Meme Smuggler, who all oversee my scripts and helps me correct mistakes. I have also linked any sources used in the spotlight, such as art and videos, in the video description below. Thank you so much again for watching the spotlights. If you want to see more, click on the playlist linked in front of you. Don't forget to leave that like, and thank you for watching to the end. You are a true fan. Until next time, my name's Sun Mengs, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye!